Well, let's take a stroll down the glorious, uh, I guess you can't walk on the flowers, I don't know. Anyway, nice tunnel there. But um, we want to talk about giving. And uh, at the uh, triumphal entry, they threw uh, flowers and things, palms in the, in the way. Uh, it wasn't to really make a path. It was just to, to be a celebration. And this was the way you recognized a king. And they called him Messiah. They called him the Christ, the uh, anointed one. And uh, this was a recognition of Jesus of Nazareth, the man who is also the Son of God. And uh, there is an importance to that that we probably don't recognize. Uh, Christ had, dare I say, engineered this. He uh, sent out <clears throat> his group of uh, disciples on a path that he told them to, to go through and tell them about Jesus and he sent them on the path that he would take on his road to Jerusalem for the triumphal entry. So uh, those who were coming and would see him coming even be before this, before he got to Jerusalem, uh, would recognize it's happening. And the people who were leaving and coming ahead saying, uh, uh, the, the prophet is coming, the, the Messiah is coming. And uh, so when it happened, there was a, a great tumult, and of course, the uh, stern rulers of the temple area saying, do you hear what's going on here? Do you hear what they're saying? He says, yes. And he says, if they were to stop, the rocks themselves would have to have mouths to cry out. This was a time when the recognition that God had come in the flesh had to be made, and... Um, short-lived because next Sunday we will be celebrating his raising from the dead. So in, in some cases, some of the same people that perhaps were shouting hallelujah were shouting down with him uh, by the end of the week. I want to speak to you about giving and giving spiritually, not materialistically. That's a pretty long word, isn't it? But we get it uh, according to the ism of materialism. Second Corinthians, this is your giving practice, giving yourself, giving your time, giving your talents, giving your money. Your giving practice reveals your view of life, whether you intend it to or not. Second Corinthians 9, 6, and 7. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall also reap sparingly. He which soweth bountifully shall, also, shall reap also bountifully. And we talked about this, the Bible study of this passage bountifully actually means not so much a lot as it means to give for the purpose of being a blessing. Uh, that also by reflection would mean that sparingly would mean to give without that sense of wanting to be a blessing. Just giving, see, and that's really what he's talking about here. Then he says, every man giving according as he purposeth in his heart. We looked at that Last week, as God, uh, if you were here and remember, uh, to give purposely, uh, to have a purpose to decide on what you should give, not impulsively. But here he goes on to say, so let him give not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Grudgingly means I've got to do it. I don't really want to, but I've got to do it. The Geneva Bible, which was the standard Bible of the Puritans before the King James was translated, and so often the King James went with the uh, wording of the Geneva Bible because it was the, the Bible that was common to, uh, commonly known, memorized, and so on by the people of the day. But uh, there were other things that needed to be changed. But the Geneva Bible says of this word grudgingly, with a sparing or tight-fisted and grudging resentful heart. <laughs> This is where I don't want to do it, but everybody's watching, so I just got to put that money in. Grudgingly actually is two words in the Greek, ek lupes. Ek, you might recognize from exit, in other words, that means out or out of. Out just means you're not in, and out of means sort of you've come out of, pictures a, a contrast. And then Lupe is Strong's 3077, 
and it's translated various ways, but the actual meaning is sorrow, pain, grief, annoyance, or even affliction. And I, I think by looking at this, and, and we're going to look here at defining grudgingly by comparing it to the way God uses it in other verses. And I think you're going to get a, a picture of this. I find it uh, humorous to, to think of it this way. But uh, you have to imagine, uh, you know, Ebenezer Scrooge uh, pinching that penny till it squeals, uh, putting it in, and you get the idea of what he says about grudgingly. Other verses with this word, it can mean severe physical pain. In uh, John 16, 20, it says, A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow. There is this word. Hath sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered to the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. A preacher told me that he, he found when he was visiting a woman who was in labor, or nearly in labor, that he would share this verse with her to give her a hope of, <laughs> there was going to be an end to this, and you're going to love that child and rejoice in it. So, uh, but anyway, here's the word sorrow. So he says here, don't give a generous offering like delivering a baby. Ah, so painful, but finally I get it done. It also is used of severe emotional pain. Hebrews 12, 11. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. Nobody says, oh boy, another spanking. But it seems grievous. There's our word. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. I've never known really anybody who had parents who properly disciplined, who said that they enjoy being disciplined, but they grown up and they said, I'm really irritated by those people that never got the discipline when they were growing up. I see what they're like and I'm really glad I got what I got and I was trained that way. But here, if we apply that here, it means don't give a generous offering like taking a beating. <laughs> I got to get through this. So I'll give it. He says, don't, don't give like that. It's also used of suffering by persecution. 1 Peter 2.19 For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. So here, whether that's beating, uh, isolation, whatever, suffering by persecution. So don't give a generous offering like a martyr losing all he has. Well, I have to be burned at the stake, but I'll give it. And then internal grief and shame. 2 Corinthians 7.10, For godly sorrow, here's our word, worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but sorrow of the world worketh death. So don't give a generous offering like a sad sinner weeping over sins. What a picture. Um, <laughs> okay. I have to get it done soon. He says, that's, that's not the picture that I want you to have when you're giving. Now, secondly, I want to refer to this because you learned this when you were lost. If you are here as a Bible-believing Christian, if you have trusted Christ as your Savior, and I say here, you're in the sound of my voice, wherever that goes, we have an increased number of... Um, people from the Philippines that are writing and saying, we, we enjoyed listening to your message. So I praise God for that. But you learned this when you were lost. You turned from this present evil age to Christ. And Jesus explains this concept. Matthew 16, 26. For what is a man profited in the final analysis if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? When you put it this way, what happened when you, were, when you were ready to trust Christ, if magically some giant table or temple or something appeared that had all the money in the world, that it included all the power, all the influence and everything, you could turn there and have that but you would lose your soul. You would say, no question, my soul is going to last forever, and this won't. 
So this would be fun to have. This would be fun to play with. This would be fun to buy anything I want or give away to anything I want. But I need Christ. And you would turn your back on all of that. You see, and this is, this is that concept that you don't give grudgingly because what you are dealing with is so much more important than all of that. Having wealth is not our goal in life. Using our wealth wisely for the glory of God is a main life goal. So I think it's an important lesson. We already, we already learned this. But we kind of drift back after we got saved, saying, yeah, but I, I've got bills to pay. I've got stuff like this. The third thing is this. Maintain this truth that you learned earlier. Maintain this truth while saved. We don't want to be a backslider. We don't want to be the person climbing that gentle hill with roller skates, you know, because we just stop, we just roll back. You have to keep going, you have to keep working. So maintain this truth while you're saved. Look at Colossians 2.6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. You know, there's a wonderful image here that you're saying I have to, I have to trust Christ to get saved because I see I can't do it myself. Like walking a tightrope you know, across Niagara Falls or something. I can't do that. Walking on water to Jesus, as Peter did, all, made it almost to him. He said, I, I just can't do that. But, but if he wants me to, I can. If he gives me the power, I can. And so the, the way it works is it, we're... We're reaching out and we're touching him. We're resting on him. We're counting on him to get the thing done. That's how we got saved. That's the experience you had when you turned from the world to Christ. When your mind became enlightened to understand, I need this and I can have it. But it's through Christ. So that's how you were saved. You weren't doing it on your own. You were climbing the mountain of holiness by yourself. But he says, I want you to live like that. Your life actually is too hard for you to get saved by Christ and then go to psychology, world psychology for your life, for the answers to your problems of, of family and, and uh, addiction and uh, parenting and living with unreasonable parents, you know, all those things. Uh, this is the thing that we need to recognize. We, we are to continue to walk in our trust of Jesus, to walk that life by faith. So you are saved by trusting Christ to do for you what you could not do for yourself. So do not begin to value worldly things above the spiritual. Just don't do that. Don't go that direction. When you do that, you are straying from Christianity to materialism. Now, what is materialism? Well, materialism is a philosoph philosophical concept, if you, if you approach it that way, or just a practical concept. Let's define that. The philosophical would be this. The theory, you would ascribe to the theory that physical matter is the only reality and that everything including thought, feeling, mind, and will, can all be explained in terms of matter and physical phenomena, that it's all just part of the molecules. On the practical side, a lot more people are practical materialists, it's the attitude that physical well-being and worldly possessions constitute the greatest good and highest value in life. I am striving for the best, materially. <laughs> you see. And you have, you've adopted materialism as your practical attitude. So we look at the Bible and we try to look at this thing of materialism. We find out, first of all, materialism is foolish. Listen to 1 John 2, 15 to 17. He says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Loving the things that are in the world, that's materialism. 
loving them, not just using them, not having to deal with them, but loving them. This is the miser, ha, 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 you know, loving this thing. Uncle Scrooge diving into the big treasury of his money. Now, some of you aren't literary people. He says, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. See, the, you, the love of your life can't be double focused. It's one or the other. And then he explains, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, let me just say, lust of the flesh, that's your normal appetites, like I need to eat and I need to sleep, want to uh, have relations with my wife and this type of thing. Those are the appetites of the flesh, and God-given, and there's godly ways to fulfill it. But if you want more than the money to meet your needs, if you want more than the possessions that you can uh, use, if you want more food than you're the glutton, you know, if you're domination by uh, other uh, addictions, that's the lust of the flesh. That's going beyond the limits that God set on our appetites. Then the lust of the eyes, that's looking around and saying, I want it all, I want it all. And that's covetousness. And then the pride of life, the word pride here, is a boastful pride. This means not just I'm taking pride in a job well done. It means I'm better than you. And I'm better than you because I have more than you, and I do more than you, and I, whatever else. And he says, uh, be content to serve the Lord. Christ said, this whole thing of lording it over others, he says, that's not the way we are. We think that the, the best person, the highest honor, goes to those who serve the most, who show the love of God the most. He says, all these things, they are not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Heard the story of a pastor who went to see one of his church members after a flood in their downtown area, and this man was a real estate agent. And this was back before everything was stored on computers. And so uh, the man was there, and he had just uh, finished shoveling out about a foot and a half of mud out of his office. So things were still dirty, you know, but, um, but the pastor didn't wade into it to, to see him. But he came in and he said, I just wanted to tell you how, how sorry I am because the flood had come in and there was a, you know, file cabinets full of all his papers, all of his records. And uh, some of these couldn't be saved. Some of these papers stuck together. They, when they dried out, they were a solid block and just had to be thrown away. So he, he lost so much of his records, and the pastor truly, with a broken heart, said, I'm so sorry to see this. You, you must be going through a lot of pain. And the man looked up at him and he said, oh, no. He said, Pastor, God's going to burn all of this up in a little bit. I, I have my life. I have the ability to start over and do the best we can. And the pastor was shocked. I mean, pleasantly shocked but uh, thrilled to find that. Well, I heard that uh, Bud and Jody's house was aflame and uh, starting to burn down. I, I called her to find out. And I said, what, what's happening? She said, well, we're standing outside and we're watching the firemen fight the fire. <laughs> Jody was the epitome of an elegant woman, taste, exquisite taste inherited from her mother I believe just wonderful wonderful taste in all these things she had beautiful things and some not beautiful things uh, several heads of animals that Bud had shot and they had decorating the walls but they were impressive <laughs> and um, and I thought of all those things that that uh, she didn't glory in them but uh, um, many of these things she inherited from her her mother and they were precious things and my heart just broke and I said, Jody, how are you doing? She said, Pastor, I'm just holding it all in her open hand. God can take it whenever he wants. Whew. Man. So I hope it can be that strong in times of trouble. Uh, amazing. So it's all passing. 
it's going to burn up one, one time or another. Uh, don't love something that's going to absolutely be taken from you. In one moment after you're dead, you don't have any of this stuff. Not your concern. And one way or the other, it won't matter to you. You'll have all of heaven or you'll, you'll be in Hades wishing that you had the worst of times back on earth. Material possessions are not of the Father, which is eternal, but they're just temporary of time. Let me tell you a story. Tell you a story, and I love uh, Pilgrim's Progress. I don't know if you've read Pilgrim's Progress, but assign that to yourself, part of your bucket list. Make sure you get a hold of this and read through Pilgrim's Progress, <clears throat> written by uh, John Bunyan, who was uh, writing while he was in prison for for being a, a gospel preacher. <clears throat> the established church didn't like that. So he wrote this, and it's become one of the, one of the long-lasting books uh, equaling the Bible in translations and sales and so on through these years. And uh, the reason is, not that everything he says is right, but it's so thought out well. And the picture in it, the, the writer says, I had a dream. And a man named Christian is trying to, um, trying to get to the promised land, the glorious city. And he's fleeing the city of destruction where he lives, you see. So it's an analogy. All right, at this point, I wanted to share this about a lesson that Christian learned. And uh, so he says, I saw moreover in my dream, the writer says, that the interpreter, the interpreter is a person who showed Christian various things that were symbolic and then explained them to him. Interpreter took him by the hand and led him into a little room where sat two little children, each one in his chair. The name of the eldest was Passion. The name of the other, Patience. Passion seemed to be much discontented, but Patience was very quiet. Then Christian asked, interpreter, what is the reason for the discontent of passion? The interpreter answered, the governor of them, the, 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 the child watcher of them, would have him stay for his best things till the beginning of next year. You don't get your best things until next year. Passion is just very discontented with that. But he will have all now. He wants it now, wants it now, wants it now. But patience is willing to wait. Then I saw that one came to passion and brought him a bag of treasure and poured it down at his feet, the which he took up and rejoiced therein and withal laughed patience to scorn. <laughs> you were content to wait. Look, I got what I was discontented about. But I beheld but a while and he had lavished all away. And had nothing left him but rags. Hmm. Didn't last very long. It was only temporary. Christian asks the interpreter to explain this. So he said, these two lads are figures. Passion of the men of this world. And patience of the men of that which is to come. For, as here thou seest, passion will have all now, this year. That is to say, in this world. So are the men of this world. They must have all their good things now. They cannot stay till the next year, that is, until the next world, for their portion of good. They can't wait. They want it now. That proverb, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, is of more authority with them than are all the divine testimonies of the good of the world to come. But as thou sawest that he had quickly lavished all away, and had presently left him nothing but rags, so will it be with all such men at the end of this world. Christian. Then said Christian, now I see that patience has the best wisdom, and that upon many accounts. One, because he stays for the best things, and two, he also because he will have the glory of his when the other has nothing but rags. Interpreter, nay, but you may add another, to it the glory of the next world will never wear out. But these are suddenly gone. 
Therefore, passion has had not so much reason to laugh at patience because he had his good things first, as patience will have to laugh at passion because he had his best things last. For the first must give place to the last, be an ending, because last must have his time to come. But last must gives place to nothing, for there is not another to succeed. He has it forever. He therefore that hath his portion first must needs have a time to spend it, but he that hath his portion last must have it lastingly. Therefore it is said of Dives. Dives is a word they use for the rich man in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. So they gave him a name. Lazarus had a name. They gave him rich man Dives. So it is said of Dives, In thy lifetime thou receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Christian, then I perceive it is not best to covet things that are now, but to wait for the things to come. Interpreter, you say truth. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. Though this be so, yet since things present, the stuff around us, and our fleshly appetite are such near neighbors to one another, and again because the things to come and our carnal sense, our fleshly sense, are such strangers to one another, therefore it is that the first of these so suddenly fall into amity, uh, the, the Man of the world likes the things of the present, and amity is friendship. They, I'm good friends with the things of the world. And that distance is so continued between the second. So the, uh, the fleshly thinking says, I'm not willing to wait for the good things, but I want it now. A lesson to be learned from two lads. Materialism is defeating. It is self-defeating. It is a, um, it's a thing that eats itself. <laughs> when you adopt a temporal value system, only what I can reach in this time is good for me. You fall under condemnation, a condemnation. When this becomes your love, when this becomes your focus, when this becomes your love, you fall under condemnation. Here's the passage. Hebrews 12, 15, and 16, looking diligently, this is be looking upon, inspecting, overseeing, looking after, caring for. This word diligently carries a lot of work. Lest any man fail of or fall from the grace of God. That sounds bad, and it is. It is not losing your salvation. It is just losing your ability to live the Christian life. Three things happen. Bitterness lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. So if you are harboring bitterness, this is one of the three root sins that actually cause the flow of grace into your heart to dry up, to be clogged. The second is immorality, lest any, there be any fornicator. And the third is what we're talking about, the temporal value system. This is where your life is based on what is at hand, what you can reach. And the quote goes like this, or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. What is this profane lifestyle? Good uh, commentator Adam Clark says, the word which we translate profane, he deals with the meaning of the word, was applied to those who were not initiated into the sacred mysteries of the cults or who were despisers of sacred things and consequently were to be denied admittance to the temple. They were not permitted to assist at holy rites. Indeed, among the Greeks, profane signified anything or person which was not consecrated to the gods. So this is the word as it, as it was used before the New Testament. But it was used in the New Testament, Arthur Pink talks about this and compares it to Esau. Esau preferred the gratification of the flesh. He wanted that bowl of chili, good ground beef or beef something, maybe goat. Preferred the gratification of the flesh rather than the blessing of God. Pink says, alas, 
how many there are like him in the world today. What vast numbers prefer carnal pleasures to spiritual joys, temporal advantages to eternal riches, physical gratification to the soul's salvation. The profane are guilty of trampling God's pearls before their feet. Reading it reminds me of a young man that used to come to our church. He was cursed with immensely good looks. He was a person who across the room, the girls would look and start primping and try to walk up and talk to him. He was unmarried, but had a problem with keeping himself pure. Cursed as he was. I've been singularly blessed in that regard. Nobody has thrown themselves down at me and said, please, please, take me, take me, which I'm happy to say, but uh, never was tempted by that. He was. And I, you know, he felt guilty about it, but then he did it again. I said to him, he, he was talking about how the whole concept of the tribulation period scared him to death. And I said, and it well it should. Because until you have a strong conviction that you are saved and on the path of righteousness, you should doubt your salvation. And really the final thing that he said to me before we kind of stopped going into equal paths he said, I don't think God wants me to just sit around with my thumb, stuck on my thumb. He's saying, I think God wants me to be happy and this is what makes me happy. And I said, don't be deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. But he made his choice. We find this profane lifestyle then brings the loss of grace into your life. This causes you to fail the grace of God, lest any man fail of or fall from the grace of God. Remember, you know, people say, what's the definition of grace? And the, the standard answer was God's unmerited favor. But that's so broad. I mean, everything that we receive from God is unmerited favor, rain, uh, good weather, you know, good food, everything. So that's, when, when a word means everything, it means nothing. You know, you can't decide what it means. So let's take a Bible meaning of, of the action of grace. What does that mean? Well, that's from Philippians 2.13. God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. To want to do his good pleasure and to do here refers to your ability to do it. I was um, finishing up after school on an evening course that I was teaching. And um, one of the people said, there's a man here needs to talk to somebody. And so uh, I said, well, have him come on in. So we were talking and he had had a bad experience. He went to a Christian school, but um, he wasn't willing to do something. The, the pastor who was the principal of the school wanted and uh, so that uh, pastor principal uh, then refused to give him his graduation certificate so he you know and, and so he he kind of threw it away you know who, who cares you know i don't need your your stinking approval and then he was trying to do something with his life without a, a official uh, high school education he went to the army and they said you have to have a high school education and so then he was working, trying to get back there. And he was at a standstill. And uh, his whole life kind of fell apart. And I said, well, it sounds to me like you're actually failing of the grace of God. And I said, that, that means that probably one or more of the root sins. Bitterness, I'm thinking, maybe. Bitterness about this pastor who took a stand. And whether he was right or wrong... The thing is, right now, you're bitter, your bitterness. And I said, 
I kind of hate to tell you this, but the only way around that is for you to go to him and for you to ask for forgiveness for the bitterness which God condemns that you've been harboring. He wasn't sure he could do that. I said, the other is immorality. And he said, yeah, I've, I've drifted into that too. And the other is the temporal lifestyle, which I don't care about waiting for the things to come. I want my stuff now. And he says, that's, that's me. So we talked and I laid it out for him what he had to do to, to change that. So I, I didn't hear from him again. I just hope that he listened. But this is it. I said, you're at the place where God's feeding of grace to you has stopped. So you don't even want to do what God says. And if you do try, you can't do it. We don't want to be there. The loss of grace in your life means not only that you cannot do the will of God, but also that you do not even want to do it. You're in a bad condition. And then the loss of blessing. With this value system, you actually deny God's gracious providence. In 2 Timothy 3.5, he talks about the false teachers having a form of godliness. This is a, a religious form. So you have that form, rituals and things, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. It has no power, you know, religious activity without a heart. Albert Barnes says, as Esau, the birthright in his circumstances was a high honor. As the eldest son, all the honor connected with this, and which is now associated with the name Jacob, his younger brother, by a minute or whatever it was, would have properly appertained to Esau. But he, Esau, undervalued it. Sold his birthright, Esau parted with what we can easily understand by reflecting on the honors which have clustered around the name Jacob, the name Israel, the founder of the nation. Uh, God blessed him, but not Esau. John Calvin said, as Esau, profane then are all they in whom the love of the world so reigns and prevails that they forget heaven, as is the case with those who are led away by ambition or become fond of money or of wealth or give themselves up to gluttony or become entangled in any other pleasures. They allow in their thoughts and cares no place, or it may be the last place, to the spiritual kingdom of Christ. When you put these other things first, what have you pushed out? Let me stop with C, the loss of discernment. Because you go that direction, and you can't see things the way they really are. When Israel lost discernment in giving, because it was a law for them. Tithing was a law. Malachi 3.8 Will a man rob God? He says, what a picture. The guy in a little bandit, bandit thing around his mouth, you know, and comes up with a gun and sticks it in the back, God's back and says, stick him up. <laughs> he says, quite a picture, huh? And God says to them, yet you have robbed me. But you say, what? I don't understand. How could that be? No discernment here. Wherein have we robbed thee? He says, remember that commandment about tithing? In tithes and offerings, you kept what is owed to me. But even in the time of grace, the disciples lost discernment in giving. Horrible time, Matthew 26, 7 and 8. There came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment. This is that soothing ointment, the great smelling ointment. Think of it as a, a body lotion, beautiful perfume, all mixed together. And poured it on his head as he sat at meat. This was not <laughs> like these guys with the, the ice thing at the end of the football team, dumping it on the coach. This is, this is a gentle anointing of a soothing oil and a fragrance. And poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when the disciples saw it, they said, Oh, glory to God, she understands he's the Son of God. <laughs> no. They didn't have any discernment here. They said, <sighs> they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is 
this waste honoring the Lord Jesus Christ with her goods was a waste? John 12, 5. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence? A pence, one penny, was the no normal daily wage of a, of a laboring man. 300 days wages of a worker. Nearly a year. Why was this ointment not sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? I'll tell you, you study that, those passages, you find out it, it was Judas that led the chorus here because he thought I could have had that in the bag and I could have stolen some of that because he was, he was dipping into the bag for himself. You lose discernment and money becomes more important than your honoring God. Let's learn what it means then to give spiritually, not materialistically. Let's get out of that mindset. Let's pray. Father, all about us are the material things. Our lives are concerned with material items. Father, help us to be the Abraham and the Isaac who, though you had promised them the entire land, yet they would not build on it. They would build no foundation, but lived in their tents and moved from place to place. They built their altars and served you wherever they went. Father, help us then to live as pilgrims in this place. One day we will return and will be on the throne with you, ruling the entire world. In that sense, we have been promised this world as well as uh, Abraham was promised the Holy Land. But Father, I ask that you might so guide and direct that we might come to this place, Father, that we may use the things of this world but we will not love them. We will seek in our use to be a proper steward of your, of your goods, what you have lent to us, and to use it properly as unto thee, that we may give then spiritually, not materialistically, that as we give, there will be no grudgingly in our giving. With heads bowed, eyes closed, it may be you're saying, Pastor, I've struggled with this a bit. That um, Should I give it in the offering plate or should I put it in my, my pocket? Do I keep it for myself? Do I keep it for something that I would like? Or can I give it? My time. I have so little time to do what I want. Shall I give it to the Lord? Shall I go to that service? Or shall I take it for myself? Shall I use my talents for myself? If God is dealing with you in this and you'd like to turn that over to him, I wonder if you'd just say, pray for me. Slip your hand up. Say, pray for me. I need to settle this, that my giving is spiritual. I'm not affected by materialism. Pray for me. Is there one? Father, thank you then for dealing with us in such a way that you say that you do not love giving that is given grudgingly. Help us, Father, then to be above the materialism of this world, to see that it's but passing. But what is eternal is what is done for you. Only what's done for you will last. And so, Father, we, we want to think of the long term like patience and not be greedy of the here and now like passion. Pray for each one of us to learn to give spiritually. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.